I'm Bob Solomon. I want to begin with a confession. I'm in love with Nietzsche. I have been since I started reading him in high school. Since then, I've read him I don't know how many times. I've written books, articles. I married a fellow Nietzsche scholar, whom you will meet shortly. Nietzsche fascinates me. He always seduces me. At the same time, he's outrageous. He's infuriating. He's inconsistent. And I always find myself trying to make sense of it, even after 30 years. What I'd like to do in these lectures is to try and give some system, some shape to Nietzsche's thought. And I want to be very clear that I'm not going to try and formalize him or even systematize him as much as run through some of his most famous themes. Some of them, no doubt, will offend you too. That's intentional. Nietzsche wanted to be polemical. His whole philosophy is aimed not at presenting a worldview so much as making us think, and in particular, making us examine ourselves and ultimately love our lives. The themes are famous enough, and these lectures will be structured around them. First of all, of course, there's the infamous doctrine of the Übermensch, the Superman, an almost cartoon-like character that, in fact, plays a very small role in Nietzsche's actual writing and is made famous more by George Bernard Shaw, who wrote a parodic play of him, than by the real centrality in Nietzsche's philosophy. Nevertheless, it's an important doctrine, and it helps us to understand some of the ways that Nietzsche was thinking. There's the equally infamous notion of the will to power, which sounds as ominous as can be, especially given German history of the last hundred years or so. In fact, it's much more benign than it sounds, has much more to do with personal self-discipline and strength than it does with anything like military might. Nietzsche talks in his first work and then throughout his career about the twin Greek deities, Apollo and Dionysus. In his first work, he talks about the Apollonian, which is the individual, the rational, and the Dionysian as the sort of frenzied, orgiastic sense in which we feel ourselves as part of life throwing, flowing through us. And of course, that's going to be an important image throughout Nietzsche's philosophy. There is his attack on Christianity. When I made a trip to give a lecture in North Texas just a couple months ago, I was informed very somberly over dinner that Nietzsche was the Antichrist. That's not quite fair, but perhaps one could say he's anti-Christian, or at least he's certainly anti the kind of Christianity that he saw around him. But as we're going to argue, there's a good deal of Christianity, a good deal of Lutherism that remains in his philosophy, and Nietzsche is anything but a philosopher who is against the notion of spirituality. We're going to talk about nihilism, which is a very current word. Nietzsche has often been accused of being a nihilist, namely a philosopher who believes in nothing, who does nothing but destroy. What I'd like to show is that exact opposite is true, that what Nietzsche attacks are mainly values that he considers both popular and nihilistic, values that ultimately, as he puts it, devalue themselves. I also want to talk about his famous repudiation of morality. Nietzsche sometimes calls himself an immoralist. Well, yes and no. He certainly is a man who lived a perfectly respectable life. Everyone who knew him would comment on his courtesy, his generosity, his niceness. But nevertheless, what he says about morality is often very harsh. And what I'd like to argue is that what Nietzsche tries to do is to get us to think about morals, about ethics, about values in a different way. Part of the campaign against Christianity, against morality, is what Nietzsche calls his war against guilt and sin. Of course, he's not the only one. A few years later, Freud was to undertake a similar campaign. Guilt is neurotic. Guilt is not good for you. Guilt is not simply taking responsibility for your actions but it's putting a metaphysical weight on them that 
they don't deserve. We're going to talk about Nietzsche's fatalism, his love of fate, what he calls amor fati. It's the idea that we have a destiny, the idea that we are born with talents and potentials. And the idea of his philosophy in many ways is to get us to become who we are, as he puts it, a phrase he borrows again from ancient Greece. And along with this, there's the notion of living dangerously, a phrase which is often repeated, particularly by my undergraduates. But in fact, what he means is taking risks, for example, taking risks in what you say and what you think, not just following the herd. And Nietzsche, of course, is perhaps the best living example of that kind of an attitude. When you're talking about a single philosopher or a single thinker, of course, it's very important to talk about the biography. Who was this guy? And in particular, in Nietzsche's case, Nietzsche taught that the philosopher should be an example. And he made enormous demands of the philosophers of the past, Socrates, for example, or Immanuel Kant, to sort of live through their philosophy and would always ask the question, what does the philosophy say about the philosopher? And the other way around, what does the philosopher show us about the philosophy? Well, of course, having said that, it becomes imperative as well as fair to apply the same thesis to Nietzsche himself. And so the question is, what kind of a man was this who presented us with such images as the Ubermensch, the will to power, the Apollonian and Dionysian, who attacked Christianity and morality right at its very roots, who attacked modern life as being decadent, who talked about fatalism, who talked about living dangerously. The story can be told in a way very briefly. Nietzsche had a very unhappy life. He did not live all that long. As almost everyone knows, he died after 10 years of nearly total insanity. His productive years were, in fact, very short. He wrote his first book in 1872 and his last books in 1888. In between, he had a really miraculous production of some of the best German prose and some of the wildest and most interesting German thinking that's to be found in the entire culture, or for that matter, in all of Europe. Talking about Nietzsche's life, let's start with the obvious, and that is with Nietzsche's mustache. Nietzsche had a mustache for most of his mature life. The pictures we have of him when he was a young professor in Switzerland, he already is sporting a mighty handsome upper lip. Of course, one of the most famous depictions of him, photograph taken very late in life when he was already insane, is a very wild, rich mustache that most of us probably couldn't wear in public. Unfortunately, that's often taken as the depiction of Nietzsche. Um, it's unfair. Uh, the twinkle in his eye is gone. It's replaced by the gaze of someone who has literally lost his mind. But nevertheless, the mustache is something that he lived with most of his adult life and he sometimes talked about. In particular, the mustache for him represented the military life. Nietzsche, in fact, served in the military only very briefly, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But basically, he never lost a certain kind of fascination, a certain sort of admiration for military discipline. That's not to say that he was a warmonger, or for that matter, liked war at all, approved of it? No. But what we get in Nietzsche is always this sense that the military attitude is very important towards living a proper, fulfilling life. And although a mustache might not look as if it represents discipline, in Nietzsche's mind, that is certainly part of the picture. The other part, perhaps, is more telling. Nietzsche said in several different places that the mustache was a kind of a mask. After all, if you ask most people, what does Nietzsche look like? What they will immediately say is, oh, that's the guy with the huge mustache. And if you ask, well, what about the eyes? What about the nose? What about the chin? 
What about the hair? They'll tra probably draw a blank. And Nietzsche himself points out that when you see someone with a big, handsome mustache, what they see is the mustache. It is a mask. It allowed Nietzsche, in effect, to hide. The underlying psychological truth of Nietzsche's life, and certainly his mature life, was that he was alone. I want to talk about that in a little bit of detail, but first let's go back to the beginning. He was small, born in a small German town in 1844. He was raised as a Lutheran. In fact, his father was a Lutheran minister. His mother, his aunts, his grandmother were all pious Lutherans. His father sadly died when he was only four years old. And so he was raised in a family of women, in a family of pious Lutherans. And of course, you don't have to be a deep Freudian to think this is what he's reacting against later in his comments about Christianity, but perhaps more infamously in some of his often quoted comments about women. He grew up as obviously a very bright young man, and early in life he fell in love. What he fell in love with were the classics. And that, of course, was the career that he then pursued. He proved himself a very able student. He got a professorship at the unbelievable age of 24 years old, and he had a brilliant career in front of him. Unfortunately, before that career progressed very far, he served in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71 as a medical orderly. But she put that even so, he had already given up his German citizenship, and he was, in fact, a Swiss citizen for out, throughout his career. I was told at dinner just a few nights ago by um, a young man that Nietzsche was, together with Rousseau, one of the great Swiss philosophers of all time. It's very tongue-in-cheek, but it's an important point, since Nietzsche is so often affiliated with German, German military thinking and so on. It's important to point out that, in fact, he lived most of his mature life in Switzerland, in northern Italy, and not in Germany. When he was in the military for a brief time, he did contract some series of diseases, and many of them progressed over the years to the point where, by the late 1870s, he had to resign the professorship. And he spent the rest of his life, in fact, wandering, for the most part alone, in some of the most gorgeous spots in the world. He spent time in a small town called Sils Maria. He spent time in Nice. He spent a good deal of time in various places around the Alps and the lakes in northern Italy, in southern Switzerland. He was a man with a keen aesthetic eye, and it's very clear that in his loneliness, what he really wanted was beauty, which would make him feel more alive, make him feel more at home on earth, give him something to look at, a good place to think. But it's hard to underestimate the loneliness. Early in his life, he had proposed to a young woman after a courtship of what today we would call maybe a date and a half. Not too surprisingly, he was turned down. More dramatically, in 1882, while he was writing what became one of his most famous books, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, he met a woman who, in retrospect, as well as at the time, was certainly one of the most dazzling women in Europe both intellectually, in terms of personality, in terms of looks. Lou Andreas Salome was a beautiful young woman who, in fact, later on would write one of the first insider books on Nietzsche. She was also a friend of Rilke, later would become a friend of Freud. She played a pivotal role in German, European intellectual life. Nietzsche fell madly in love with her, spent quite a few months with her, but again, when he tried to change from friendship to romance, when he proposed, he was turned down, and he virtually never got over it. Earlier in life, he had befriended 
the composer Richard Wagner. And that friendship was very close for several years, but that too ended in disappointment. And again, Nietzsche says, I never felt so alone. In fact, here's a quote that comes from about 1884, a few years after both of these situations. Almost all of my human relations have resulted from attacks of a feeling of isolation. I have not been so profoundly ill for nothing, and I'm ill on the average now still, that is to say, depressed, simply because I was lacking the right milieu and always had to play act somewhat instead of refreshing myself and people. I do not for that reason consider myself secret or furtive or a mistrustful person, quite the reverse. If I was that, I would not suffer so much. That was his letter to his sister, who would play a, another important role in his life. They were close as children, but in 1884, in fact, just at the time this letter was written, his sister married a man whom Nietzsche utterly despised. And the reason for that, I think, is something very important. Elizabeth's husband-to-be and husband was what we would call a proto-Nazi. He was a fascist in temperament. He was an anti-Semite. And Nietzsche found these views so despicable that he virtually cut off relations with his sister with whom he was very friendly. And those relationships would not be fully renewed until Nietzsche collapsed and essentially was completely helpless, at which point his sister helped first to take care of him and more problematically took over his literary estate. In fact, some of the books that we have from Nietzsche, which are no longer at all respectable, were edited and perhaps even in part written by his sister, Elizabeth. The collapse itself came in 1889. Nietzsche was in Turin in northern Italy. Again, the circumstances are telling. He embraced a horse who was being beaten by its owner clearly an act of intense compassion, not to mention a kind of sense of animal rights. When he did so, he collapsed. He was never the same again. His friends came, got him, took him eventually back to Germany, where he was cared for by his mother until she died, and then his sister until he died. It's a very sad story. So it's a story of a lonely man who, at the same time, had incredible genius just to raise a question that will come up later. What do we make of works which are so bold and courageous, coming from a man whose life was basically miserable? And I think one way to look at it, of course, is to say the works, the ideas, were compensation for the life. But I think there's a better way. And the better way is to say the works were Nietzsche's life. Let's talk about those works. In 1872, Nietzsche wrote his first book, The Birth of Tragedy. It was, without footnotes, it was outrageous. It was not the book that his academic colleagues had expected. It defended the thesis that tragedy arose among the Greeks out of a combination of two forces. The Apollonian, the individual, the rationalistic, represented, for example, by Socrates, and then the Dionysian, derived from the Orphic cults. It was orgiastic. It was that sense of life flowing together. And the brilliance of the Greeks, the way the Greeks invented tragedy, but more importantly, the way the Greeks learned to cope with a very difficult life, was by combining these two forces and understanding that life was tragic. It's a sense we've lost now, and a good deal of the book is the comparison between the Greeks and ourselves. In fact, much of Nietzsche's career and a good deal of German philosophy in the 19th century could be characterized in terms of a profound admiration, even an envy, for the way the ancient Greeks lived, their sense of life, their sense of vitality. And the contrast is with what is now called modernity and a life which is defined by middle class or bourgeois values. In the following year, 1873, Nietzsche begins a series of what was intended to be 13 essays called Untimely or Unfashionable Meditations. 
The first of these was a meditation on the life of Jesus. More directly, it was a meditation on a contemporary writer on the life of Jesus. In a way, it's a nasty piece of work. Nasty, that is, towards the contemporary writer. Towards Jesus, however, it wasn't really nasty at all. In fact, a point to be made, given Nietzsche's reputation as a harsh anti-Christian, is that where Jesus is concerned, Nietzsche pretty much leaves him alone, and in fact often expresses a kind of admiration, if not so much for his teachings, then certainly for him as a man. The second meditation was a meditation on history. And given Nietzsche's admiration, almost worship of the ancient Greeks, it provides a very important counterbalance because there's a danger that Nietzsche sees very clearly in his profession of philology in particular, but in intellectual life in Germany in general, that the admiration for the ancients would be so great that it would be overwhelming, that one would simply dismiss contemporary life and spend all time just wallowing in history and wallowing in the classics. The theme of the second essay is basically that we should use history, and we should use history in particular to make our lives better and richer. The third essay is about one of Nietzsche's most profound influences, the German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer is widely known as the great pessimist, or perhaps we could say the great crank in philosophical history. His sense was, in a word, that life is no good. Schopenhauer had a magnificent philosophy to back this up. He's one of the most brilliant of German writers. But Nietzsche never accepted the pessimism, although he was greatly in awe of what Schopenhauer had done as a philosopher. In fact, one could look at Nietzsche's whole career as an attempt to slough off Schopenhauer's pessimism and maintain instead, in line with the ancient Greeks, that life is good, life is great. In fact, even if it contains suffering, even if it involves tragedy, even if it ends in death, nevertheless, life is something to be enjoyed. Life is something to be profoundly felt. The fourth essay is an essay on another of the great influences of Nietzsche's life, and that's the composer Wagner. It is very much an admiring essay, and there's an irony to this because it was published just at the time when, in fact, the relationship between Nietzsche and Wagner was disintegrating. And perhaps it's worth saying that the most important point of disagreement between them, where Nietzsche really threw off Wagner entirely, was because of Wagner's anti-Semitism. Nietzsche is often... Uh, listed on a sort of, Nietzsche is often listed as a kind of proto-Nazi, as an anti-Semite, and this is one of several times when it becomes absolutely crystal clear that one of the dominant themes of Nietzsche's life was a kind of anti-anti-Semitism. In 1878, Nietzsche begins a remarkable series of books. It's when Nietzsche really becomes Nietzsche. The first consists of a several-volume set called Human All Too Human. And what is immediately striking about these books and the couple books to follow is they're written in aphorisms, very short, often one line, or at least one short paragraph bits, which have some profound insight, some great exclamation, some probing question, some historical anecdote, But the basic idea, as in all of Nietzsche's works, is to jar us, to make us think about things in a different way, to get us to see things in different perspectives. The second of this series was a book called Daybreak, indicating a kind of new dawn in Nietzsche's philosophy. It begins what he calls his campaign against morality, and in effect what it does is it looks at a good many of our moral prejudices, It looks at a good deal of our moral ideals, and what it points out is that behind the facade of the divine given commandment, behind the facade of the rational principle, often is a kind of dirty little secret, a bit of selfishness, a bit of smugness, a bit of superiority. For example, 
the emotion of pity or compassion, which almost all authors have praised, back to the ancient Chinese, but also Kant and Schopenhauer. Nietzsche points out that very often our pity is really nothing but a kind of superiority. Following Daybreak, Nietzsche publishes what is probably his most personal book, a book called The Gay Science. It is also largely aphoristic. In it, he introduces such themes as the death of God and the extremely life-affirming thesis, which he calls eternal recurrence, the idea that we live our lives not just once, but over and over and over again. And this is a thesis which is not supposed to depress us, but to the contrary. It's supposed to give us great joy. After this, Nietzsche publishes two books on ethics. The first, Beyond Good and Evil, summarizes much of his philosophy to date. It includes meditations on philosophy in general, in which he says, for example, that every philosophy is really the work of confession. It's an unconscious memoir. It is not, as philosophers present it, simply a set of abstract ideas. The next book, Genealogy of Morals, expands on one thesis from Beyond Good and Evil in particular. It's the idea that there are two kinds of morality, not just one. There's master morality, which was, as this term indicates, the morality of the aristocrats, the morality of the warriors, the morality of the heroes of ancient Greece. And then there is slave morality, a morality that comes from oppression, from servile conditions, from weakness, from inferiority. And he goes on to say that what we call morality is really just slave morality. It's a very polemical thesis, and Nietzsche announces it as such. It is often offensive, but it's an offense with a point. And again, the point is to get us to think about morality which we often praise unthinkingly, in a different way. In his last act of year, Nietzsche goes ahead and publishes four books. The first of them is called Twilight of the Idols. It is, in my mind, one of Nietzsche's greatest books. It includes the most protracted attack on Socrates. It attacks reason. It attacks morality as being something that is unnatural, it talks about the prejudices and mistakes in the tradition of philosophy going back to Aristotle, and it includes a long section which he calls the skirmishes of an untimely man, in which he, among other things, attacks many of his contemporaries, especially some folks who seem rather close to him in ideas, and we'll be talking about that too. He also publishes a book on Wagner. In this case, it's no longer praise, no longer anything like the worshipful or even admiring stance that he had taken in the early essay. Now it's Wagner as combining everything wrong with contemporary society. He also publishes The Antichrist. The title itself is enough to tell us this is a conscientiously polemical book and an autobiography, Ecce Homo. Finally, there is a book called The Will to Power. This, of course, is a phrase that Nietzsche often used I'll have much to say about it. But the book itself really is not a book at all. It's a book of notes, a book of jottings, which was put together first by Nietzsche's sister Elizabeth and then re-edited several times. But the important point about it is Nietzsche didn't write it. He may have written the notes, but I know my office is filled with notes observations, insights, ideas for books, ideas for titles. Much of it's written on napkins, scraps of paper, and so on. I'll never get it together. But it would horrify me to think that someone might get it together and publish it as something of mine. Because there's a reason why those things are not published. It's because I didn't think they were polished enough, or in some cases, I just didn't have a chance to throw them away. Many times it's just wackiness that I kind of enjoyed sticking out there, but I wouldn't ever put my name to it in public. And that's the way I want to read that particular book of Nietzsche's, too. Not that it doesn't contain some wonderful quotes. Nietzsche was a brilliant stylist, had a wonderful turn of phrase, and so on. 
But I think the important point is that with Nietzsche, trust the published works. If something in the unpublished works matches up, then it's a different way of saying the same thing. That's fine. In the following lectures, I'm not going to be going through Nietzsche book by book, although that is certainly one way to approach it, but rather in terms of themes. And what I'm going to be after, to be very brief about it, is to try and make you fall in love with Nietzsche too.